Praise God. I love to be in the house of the Lord. I hope you do too. Here we are for another Wednesday Bible study. You know, here at Bible World, we believe that the Bible is the Word of God and it's the ultimate how to book. In James chapter 1, verses 22, in the King James Version, it says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. It takes a little bit more impact when you use the Amplified Version, the same verse, James chapter 1, verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word, actively and continually obeying God's precepts and not merely listeners who hear the word but fail to internalize its meaning deluding yourselves by unsound reasoning contrary to the truth so more than any other book in the history of the world the bible is the ultimate how-to book and it really really works doesn't work like osmosis. I wish, you know, I could put my Bible on my head and have it all in my memory. We know it doesn't work that way. You read it, you apply it to your life, and then you get the benefit when you study. You apply it in your life, in your home, and in everything you do. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's pray, shall we? Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, you're so wonderful. We do love you. We magnify you. Lord, we pray that you'll continue to touch our hearts and minds. Help us to worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.
Jesus. Lord, you're worthy of all our praise and glory. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Isn't he worthy of glory and honor? We welcome you tonight to Wednesday night Bible study. We are so glad that you are here. If you are a guest, thank you for joining us this evening. If you have any questions, we invite you to see someone in our hospitality team or someone on the pastoral team. If you're joining us via the live stream tonight, we thank you for joining us. Um, if you're in the Hampton Roads area, we invite you to join us for an in-person service. There's nothing like being in the house of the Lord. There's a strength, there's a unity that can be felt when the body of Christ comes together. So once again, welcome. Let's clap our hands unto the Lord as our pastor comes this evening. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Are you glad to be in God's house tonight? I know that if not every time, almost every time I come to the pulpit, I ask that same question. Have you noticed that? 18 years. Are you glad to be in God's house? Because I really think it makes a lot of difference in what you're going to get out of being here if you're glad to be here. If you're here because you think you have to be, or here because somebody else made you, or here because whatever, other than I want to be here because I know I'm going to get something out of being here, if that's not the reason, you may not get anything out of being here. So I'm going to ask you again, are you glad to be in God's house tonight? <laughs> Praise God. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our attitude about how we feel going to God's house makes a lot of difference in what we get at God's house. Say amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I just got back with some of our men from the campground where we've been working for the last several weeks getting a lot of things taken care of, worked on the dorms, uh, a whole lot. I have uh, literally sealed those dorms every way you can possibly think of doing that to make, them, uh, to make them perfect for our young people when they arrive at youth camps here in just a couple of weeks. And then we've been building stairs and working on decks and stripping stuff and staining stuff and painting stuff and, and you name it. There's just been a lot of work going on around there. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy with how the campground is looking and that it is, in fact, uh, very close to being 100% ready for our young people when they show up. Last week of June is junior camp. First week of July is senior camp, and then July the 13th, 14, and 15 is our annual camp meeting. You're going you're gonna to want to be there for this camp meeting. The theme of the camp is Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. It ought to be what's on the mind and on the heart of every believer in the whole wide world right now. Jesus is fixing to come. Can you say amen? Brother Harper, Edwin Harper from Huntington, West Virginia, will be there teaching on end time prophecy on uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday mornings. He will be followed by our evangelist, Brother Doug Kleindens, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday from 11 till noon. And then in the evening time, I'm preaching Wednesday night, and Victor Jackson, who's a favorite preacher of mine, Victor Jackson, will be with us on Thursday and Friday night of that camp. I promise you, it is going to be a camp to remember, and if you can possibly get there, please do. Uh, we always have a great showing from Bible World for uh, that particular uh, event. Uh, I have been there before when nearly one in every four people on the camp was from Bible World. Uh, I, not 
in recent years, but in years gone by, that was the case. And so I want to encourage you, let's get back into the groove. Let's go to camp meeting. We haven't got to be in camp meeting for quite a while. Uh, we had a camp meeting last year, and people wearing masks and still doing everything we had to do in the middle of last year to, to uh, deal with COVID. This year, we ought to be able to just have ourselves an old-fashioned apostolic hoedown, and I'm ready for that. How about you? <laughs> Praise God. My subject tonight is enemy at the gates. Enemy at the gates. This is part two of a Bible study or message that I began last Wednesday evening talking to you about the fact that we have a very, very real enemy at the gate. I, wanna, I want to say something to you that's not meant to frighten you, but it is meant to wake us up. There is no generation before us. I want you to think about what I'm saying. There is no generation before us that has had to deal with the level, the measure of spiritual warfare that we deal with in 2022. Never been a generation like this. My grandfather, in my estimation, is the greatest pastor that ever lived. He was literally a pastor's pastor. He could write the book on pastoring. But my grandfather lived and died without ever one time dealing with things I've had to deal with just this week. And the sad thing is, is I've kind of got used to having to deal with some of those things. That's just kind of indicative of the day that we live in. My uncle, Brother Billy Cole, again, in my estimation, the greatest man of God that ever lived, the most powerful man of God that ever lived, saw more people get the Holy Ghost than any human that is recorded in history, a man that was operated in the gifts of the Spirit, a man that wasn't afraid of the devil, not any devil anywhere on any continent, did it cause him fear. He was one that was so highly anointed. But he lived, ministered, and died and never dealt with the things that the church is having to deal with on a regular basis today. And I'm not talking about sin when I say that. I do know that there's a measure of sin in our day that's unique to our day. I'm talking about spiritual warfare. I'm talking about the onslaught of the enemy. I'm talking about how the enemy has amplified his efforts. I'm talking about how deceptive that the enemy is today and how many voices are assisting the enemy today, whether knowingly or not, is up to them, but how many voices today that are in fact assisting the enemy in his evil work. There's never been a day like this. That's not a cliche. I'm not saying that to just get your attention or to frighten you or to in any way use that to move you from one place to another. It's just a matter of fact. There has never been a day like this day. And so my message, enemy at the gate. I told you last week that it was my intention to talk very straight to us about what we're dealing with today and the, the, the enemy's tactics that he's using today. You know, the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Don't be ignorant of Satan's devices. What does that mean? It means we ought to know the difference in when it's God and when it's the devil. When it's right and it's wrong, when it's righteous and unrighteous, we ought to know the difference. Can I get an amen? amen? There is a very real enemy that is intent on the destruction of Christian homes. Intent in his efforts to destroy Christian families, Christian marriages, intent on destroying the peace of godly people. 
Godly people who love God with all their heart is an affront to the enemy that we're fighting with today. He is out to destroy, literally destroy our relationships with God. He's working to destroy good values. He fights against morals. He doesn't like the lifestyle that you and I choose to live. He's a very real enemy, and I've come to tell you he's at the gate. I've come to tell you that he is knocking on the door of your life. He's wanting to challenge your relationship with God. If you think that because you talk in tongues, dance a little bit, because you are baptized in Jesus' name and you abstain from some things and embrace others as a matter of personal holiness, that, well, all of that means the devil will leave me alone. No, all of that makes you hell's number one enemy. The enemy's not going to bother somebody he's already got. I want that to sink in for a moment. If he's already got you, if he knows how easy it is to get you to compromise, how easy it is to get you to be unfaithful, how easy it is to get you to stop praying, to stop worshiping, to stop loving God and living for God, if he knows that you're already mentally, spiritually, you've thrown in the towel, then he's probably not fooling with you because he knows he's already got you. But if you got your mind made up, if you've determined I'm going to do what pleases God, no matter who likes it or who don't, no matter who agrees or who don't, if I'm the oddball in the family, the oddball on the job, the oddball in the neighborhood, the oddball when I go to family reunion, it just don't matter. I'm going to live for God. Now, if you've got that kind of a mindset, you're his enemy. Again, not trying to frighten you, but I am presenting these things as the facts of our spiritual life in the year 2022. I'm not, if you're thinking, oh, Brother Cunningham, I've been seeing things, I've been hearing things. I, I listen to the news and I'm starting to pick things out that, that they've got an agenda and I think they know they're lying right while they're talking. I think they know that what they're saying and what they're doing is false. I think, I think this television show and that television show is depicting a life or, or, or uh, a style of living that is so anti-God it's unrealistic and yet they're trying to make it the normal. You're starting to see some of those things. You're starting to recognize some of those things. Can I tell you, that is not a figment of your imagination. You're not imagining that there's something wrong. There is something wrong. You're not misreading the world's rhetoric. What you are seeing is a world that is turned upside down. A world that is in fact intent on fundamentally changing everything about the lifestyle that you thought was right and good and holy. Why teach stuff like this, Brother Cunningham? Because I believe we're at a moment that, that, that the cry is going out in the Holy Ghost, who's on the Lord's side? I believe that God's drawing a line saying, look, if you're for me, get on my side. If you're not for me, then you're for the world. Hello? Come on, somebody. There's a biblical picture of the enemy that is at our gates in 1 Peter 5 and 8. I'm repeating this from last week. The scripture said, be sober, be vigilant, look out for... Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Your adversary, the devil. Are you aware that the devil is in fact your adversary? Your adversary, the devil. 
is going about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I'm not going to repeat everything I said last week, but let me repeat this. You need to understand what his intent is for you. He intends to devour everything that is good about you and everything that is good in your life. He intends to devour your peace of mind. He intends to devour your emotional strength. He intends to devour your good, godly, Bible-based marriage and home life. He wants to devour everything that separates you from the world. His desire is to devour. Say amen. amen. The Bible said in John chapter 10 and verse number 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I told you last week that is your enemy's job description. Steal, kill, destroy. His job description is not peace, happiness, prosperity, get ahead, be popular. Those are all lies that he promises you. What his job description is, is to kill everything that's pure and right and godly, to steal your victory, steal your hope, steal your faith, steal your trust, and ultimately destroy your relationship with God. That is his job description. Hello? And last week I stopped... When I begin in the book of Isaiah chapters 36 and 37, I started, I should say last week, with a story that will help us understand my subject, enemy at the gate. I told you that Israel's northern kingdom in Isaiah chapter 36 no longer exists, that all of Judah's walled outposts have been captured and destroyed and that the city of Jerusalem is all that's left in Israel. The rest of Israel is destroyed. The Israeli people that didn't get killed, that have been captured, have been sent to Syria that they could somehow become slaves to the Syria. They'd be retrained and then become slaves to the Assyrian people. Jerusalem is all alone. Jerusalem is besieged. Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, is just a little dot on the map compared to the whole uh, Middle East part of the world at the time of the writing of this scripture. Jerusalem is besieged. They are surrounded by the Assyrian armies. These are the same armies that have destroyed the rest of Israel and have destroyed not only the rest of Israel, they've destroyed every nation that they've ever come up against. And there is a long list of those nations that they had destroyed. And so in their besieged state, Israel, inside the walls of their city, they are keeping the enemy out, their people in. They're going to be able to live, to be sustained for a while, but not forever in that besieged setting. The general of the Assyrian army comes to the gate of Jerusalem for the purpose of speaking to the leaders of Israel. His goal was to convince them to surrender to Assyria without a fight. Just surrender yourself to the Assyrian armies. Just give in, give up. Let us come in and take over. We are going to ship you off to Syria we're going to retrain you, and then we're going to make servants out of you, but you'll still be alive. This general attempts to convince Jerusalem, get ready for this, that resistance is useless. No reason for you to resist us. It's not possible for you to fight with us. It's not possible for you to stand against us. You cannot withstand our onslaught. That is impossible. Don't even try. That's his first message. 
And then he uses deceptive tactics for the purpose of breaking their confidence. This Assyrian general tells Jerusalem, first of all, I, I don't really have a problem with this, to be honest with you, but he tells Jerusalem, you cannot rely on Egypt as your ally. It seems that the people of Jerusalem had hoped that some way Egypt would ally with them and together they would be able to resist uh, the Assyrian army. But the truth of the matter is, Jerusalem could have whooped Egypt. Egypt is at the lowest ebb, the lowest stage of their life. They've never been in worse shape than they are at this time. Egypt is going to be no help to them at all. The next thing he tells them, he tells them that Assyria, listen to this, has embarrassed Jehovah God. And because Assyria has embarrassed Jehovah God, that they cannot depend on God to save them. He said, God won't save you because we destroyed every place of worship unto Jehovah God. We insulted your God and now he's angry and he will not save you. The third thing he does, the general mocks them knowing that they can't find enough men to even serve in their army. They've got 2,000 horses evidently, and this Assyrian general says, you can't even find 2,000 men that can ride a horse, let alone wield a sword or throw a spear without falling off the horse. And he mocks them in the gates of the city. You're a bunch of pitiful people. You can't fight with us. And then in verse number 10, the general's big lie, and I think this is the real serious one, the general's big lie is that God himself gave the Assyrian people the divine authority to attack Judah and Jerusalem. This general intended to terrify the Jews by telling them, your God told us to come destroy you. Your God told us to come and enslave you. It's the same as that general saying, God himself is doing this to you. Anybody ever had that enemy at your gate? That it's God that's doing this to you. You know, you've never heard me be a judgment preacher. I don't do it. You've never heard me say, if you don't pay your tithes, God's going to judge you. You go on vacation this week, God's going to judge you. You miss church Sunday, God's going to judge you. I don't do it. And the reason I don't do it is because it's not my job to plant in your mind that your own God is against you. This is what that general was doing. God sent us to destroy you. We're the instrument of God against you. God is doing this to you. It's amazing how many people get sick and call me, Pastor, you God do this to me. What I do to get on the wrong side of God. Now, does that happen? It does happen. It does happen. There's no doubt about it. There's times that we can so frustrate God that he just... I don't know that God actually sins bad. The Bible said all good gifts come from God. I don't know that God actually sends you bad things deliberately or just for the fun of it. But I do think there's times that he just backs off. I think there's times he just backs up and says, now let's see what humanity does to itself. Hello? What we don't give God enough credit for is how that what is going on in our life is God at work in our life. And we don't think about, wonder what life would be like if God wasn't on my side. What would, be, what would life be like if God wasn't helping me? You got no kids that broke their arms so far this summer? You got no kids that got ran over by a car, got, got a bicycle run over by a car in the neighborhood? We don't even think about all the things God protects us from. 
We listen to the news and hear it happening to everybody else and it never crosses our minds like, oh my, that could have been me. That could have been my family. The Assyrian general who is a type of Satan is really good at his job. That is sowing doubt and unbelief. The devil's number one weapon, his greatest weapon that he uses is to make us think that God has abandoned us. That God has caused us to be harmed. That God is allowing the enemy to bring damage into our life. Say, oh, Brother Kim, I've had some bad things happen to me. I know. The Bible said the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Brother Kim, I lost a loved one. I know. The Bible said we're all going to die. Someday you're going to be the loved one we lose. It's going to happen. Someday I'll be the loved one we lose if Jesus don't come. That's life, folks. That's part of natural life. It happens. Say, Brother Kim, I got sick. We all get sick. We can go all the way back and thank Sister Eve for that. She decided to eat of that fruit. All of you men that are thinking evil Eve did this to us. You know what the Apostle Paul says way over in the New Testament? He said, let me set the record straight. Eve was beguiled by the devil. Adam ate of it by choice. That isn't me, that's the Apostle Paul. He said, at least Eve's got an excuse, I guess is what he was saying. She was beguiled by the devil, but Adam, he just chose to eat it. I want you to understand that there's a lot of things that we go through that are just a part of life. It's not automatically the devil because the bald tires on your car go flat. Or when you run over a nail, your tire goes flat. You don't need to stand there and cry, look what the devil's doing to me. I preach this all over the country. I probably ought to preach it here. I tell folks that if the devil has a birthday party in hell once a year, and they say, okay, Lucifer, what's your wish? I said every year his wish is, I wish I was as powerful as apostolic people think I am. He wishes he could do everything we give him credit for. There's an awful lot of things that happen because this is life. There's a lot of things that happen because of decisions we've made. There's a lot of things happen because of who we're attached to. When the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked, he was still the Apostle Paul. He was still writing the New Testament. He still taught us more about the gifts of the Spirit than any human that ever lived. He he was the greatest missionary that ever traversed the world. And yet he was shipwrecked on an island, got bit by a snake. And the Bible decides to throw a few words in there to help us understand something. The Bible said he was chained to a Roman soldier. Paul wasn't shipwrecked because of something he had done. He didn't have to swim for his life. He didn't get on that, on that island and be shipwrecked and get bit by a snake. It all happened because of who he was connected to. And some of you got people in your family and people in your circle of friends and people that you work with that are knuckleheads. And things happen because of who you're chained to. Quit giving the devil credit for every little old thing that comes along. Either greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world, or it's not. And if it's not, throw your Bible in the trash and walk away. Hello? Think about it with me for a moment. How many of you have had one foot in hell and one foot out? And it's because of somebody you're connected to. You didn't do nothing wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. Somebody you're connected to. 
My wife back there, she can she back there amen in me. She can tell you I really do mean this. I told her four or five years ago, I told the whole church, you probably don't remember it on New Year's Eve night. I told the church that my New Year's resolution is I'm tired of feeling bad about things other people ought to be feeling bad about. Hello? I'm tired of the one getting under conviction when I didn't do it. Oh, my, 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 my. It is the trick of the devil. It's the enemy at the gate that is saying, your God did this to you. It's the enemy at the gate that's telling you that the reason you're going through this is because God's turned his back on you. He's a liar and the father of all lies. The citizens of Jerusalem are shaken in this setting because this Assyrian general is speaking to them in their own language. When the leaders of the city told the Assyrians that we'll have a parley with you, send somebody out here to talk to us, and they told them specifically, we're going to speak in the Aramaic language. You have your man speak Aramaic, we'll speak Aramaic, and then none of our people will know what's being said. We can talk openly in the gate, and nobody will be able to know what we're saying. But when the Assyrian general got there, he spoke in the Hebrew tongue perfectly. And so all the guards heard what he said. All the people stood standing around heard what he said. All the underlings to those that were leaders of the city, they understood what he was saying. And he did it on purpose because he wanted the soldiers on the wall and the others that were standing around, he wanted them to hear and understand the taunts, the threats, the lies. He wanted them to be afraid at what he was saying. Now, what does that mean to us today? Let me just interject a couple things here. I want to tell you, first of all, that the voice of Satan has never been stronger than it is today. I want you to listen to what I just said. The voice of Satan has never been stronger than it is today. Second of all, the voice of Satan has never been more effective than it is today. Y'all getting that? The devil is fluent. You got to get this. In speaking the language of our day. All these little, isn't it amazing you turn on one TV station and they make some phrase, some statement. You flip the channel over, they're making the exact same phrase. You flip the channel over and they're making the exact same phrase. And before long, you've went to five or six or seven channels and shows and, and reports and they're all using word for word the same phrases. The devil has never been more effective at getting his message out than today. And not only is he effective at getting it out, He's getting it out in what appears to be, you got to get this, what appears to be the common understanding or the common thinking of our day. If you don't believe this, Brother Kleinen sent me a text yesterday. It was absolutely hilarious. He sent me a text yesterday and put a picture in it that he got in an advertisement. It was, they were selling a t-shirt and the t-shirt had writing on it that said there are more than two genders whether you believe it or not. And then he gave me another little clip. It was the order blank for ordering one of those t-shirts. And the order blank said you have to tell us if you're a man or a woman. Which one you want, a man's shirt or a woman's shirt? They're so, their ideas and their thinking so dumb, even they can't figure it out. But everybody is saying the same thing. It's the reason they... you got to get what I'm about to say. Listen to me. It's the reason they skip 
you and me as a generation. And they're going after our kids and our young adults like you've never seen before because they don't think they can change this class's mind, but they think they can change the next generation's thinking and talking to what they're saying. The citizens of Jerusalem are shaken because this Assyrian general is speaking to them in the language that they're accustomed to. And you've got to be careful today that when you hear somebody say something, I tease my wife all the time, I'll pay for this after church, but I tease her all the time that just because somebody wrote it down and it's in the newspaper, don't make it true. Because idiots write letters too. You know that, right? Absolute educated idiots write articles too. Hmm. Thank you for that one amen. If you're not careful, you'll get to listening to the language of our day and assuming that's the norm and the way you're thinking and what you believe and your language is wrong. You'll get to thinking because everybody says two men can get married. I heard them the other day. It's no joke. I'm not making this up. A news reporter was making fun of Chick-fil-A closing on Sunday. Supposed to be Christian people. They have all these beliefs about same-sex marriage and all this stuff. They were just ripping into Chick-fil-A. And I said, well, you got to give Chick-fil-A credit for this. They're smart enough to know two roosters will put them out of business. Right. <laughs> Hello? I don't mean to be ugly, but the Bible said God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Amen. But here's the problem. You turn on the television and every sitcom depicts a lifestyle. Every, every story, every book you read has got that lifestyle in it. And then there's some news report comes up and there's people that live that lifestyle and the news reporter says, I ain't got nothing wrong with that. You know, that's good. And whatever people want to do, they're allowed to do, you know. And you got people that are supposed to be like giving you the news. That in fact what they're giving you is the philosophy and the thinking of the world that come right straight out of the pit of hell. And if you're not spiritually discerning enough to know when it is God talking and it's just the talk of this whole world. We don't need to be in concert with the world. We don't need to think like the world, talk like the world, respond like the world, act like the world. That's not who we are or how we're supposed to react. I read a book on some of the martyrs of the early church. and There's a fellow in there by the name of Polycarp that they demanded that he quit preaching Jesus that he quit preaching Jesus' name specifically, that he quit preaching that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is God. And they were burning people at the stake, and so they threatened him that if you don't quit, we're going to burn you at the stake. And so they burned him at the stake. And history says that while he is strapped to the pole and the fire is all around him, his clothes is on fire, they said, Polycarp, all you've got to do is renounce Jesus and we'll put out the fire. And history records his answer. Eighty and six years have I served him and he's never failed me one time. How can I fail him today? 
We all clap our hands and wave our hands and smiles on our faces about that. But how many of us have come to that point that we're willing to say, he's never failed me, I'm not going to fail him. He's never walked away from me, I'm not walking away from him. He's never backed up on my needs, I'm not going to back up on supporting him. We have got to be very careful that what we're doing, maybe in our own minds we're thinking we're saving our family, making it easier to trek through this world. We've got little phrases that are even used in the church now like, why don't we learn to go along? Why don't we learn to get along? Why don't we just keep our mouths shut? Why don't we say nothing? Why don't we just act like everything and everybody's okay? I'll tell you why we don't. Because it displeases God for you to call right wrong and wrong right. It displeases God. He said, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. He said, you deny my name, I'll deny you. Hello? If there's ever been a time and you might as well get used to this or go find you a denominal church that don't believe squat because I'm going to be preaching to us as long as I'm thinking that Jesus is coming like I'm thinking right now. I'm going to be preaching to us get on one side or the other. I'm going to be preaching to us let's live for God. Let's take a stand for righteousness. Let's do what pleases God no matter who else likes it or who don't like it. Amen. Amen. The devil has an end time force of evil ambassadors who regularly speak on his behalf. Hollywood speaks on his behalf. Mainstream media speaks on his behalf. I know we've got some great godly teachers in this church. But they'll be the first one to tell you they work with a bunch of ungodly teachers. And by and large, the education system is speaking on behalf of the enemy. Career politicians speaking on behalf of the enemy. Partisan judges and courts ruling on behalf of the enemy. Making rulings today that five years ago they would not have made. Did the Constitution change and I just slept through it? Did the Bible change and I just slept through it? No, it didn't. All this other stuff's what's changing. False religion. It's not easy for me to say this, but false religion is speaking on his behalf. Compromised religious voices, in my estimation, are the most dangerous, the most confusing tactics that the enemy's using. People who are not telling the truth and they know they're not telling the truth. Hello? Let me go on. The Assyrian general gets personal when he takes aim at King Hezekiah. His goal here, his goal here is to shake the people's confidence in God anointed leadership, that being King Hezekiah. He said in verse number 14, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Don't trust the leader God put in front of you. Hezekiah, I don't have time to teach all this. Hezekiah was a godly king who feared the Lord. That's what the Bible said of him. 
He was the one who ordered that the idols be destroyed and a return to true worship of God in Jerusalem after they had become for a time idol worshipers. It was Hezekiah that brought them back from idolatry to worshiping the one true God of Israel. Hezekiah trusted God to save his people. And yet the Assyrian king said in verse 15, Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Every voice that you hear that is challenging your trust in God Challenging your trust in the church. Challenging your trust in men and women of God. Ain't no way to say what I got in my mind right now. But that enemy at the gate sometimes living in the house. That enemy at the gate sometimes is riding in the car with you. That enemy at the gate is sometimes who you spend the most time on the phone with. Do you not know it is a attack of the enemy? It's one of the tactics that the, the general of the Assyrian army used against the people of God. Don't trust the man of God. Don't trust God. Don't trust the plan of God. Hello? It ain't easy for a preacher to say what I'm saying right now. There ain't no preacher on earth, am I right, that wants to get up and say, you ought to trust me, I'm the man of God. I don't like to say that. I don't want to say that. But I'm telling you, if you can't trust me, go find somebody you can trust because you need a man of God in your life you will trust. Mm -mm -mm. Hezekiah. Verse 16, the Assyrian general said, do not listen to Hezekiah. Here's what you need to do. You need to make peace with me and come out to me. Come out of the gate. Come out of the city. Come out of protection and join ranks with me because Hezekiah can't help you. He makes false promises. He promises them food and drink and most importantly, he promises them peace. We won't fight with you. You know why they won't fight with you? Because now you'll be one of the enemy. You will have turned your back on righteousness and good and godly people and joined the enemy. Are we ever going to learn as Christians? And I'm, I said we on purpose. I mean me and you, all of us. Are we ever going to learn that we can't negotiate with the devil? You can't negotiate with the devil. First of all, that's what's called compromise. Second of all, you're always going to lose because he's a liar. You can't trust anything that comes out of his mouth. Listening to the false promises of the enemy is a mistake that will have serious implications for you and your family somewhere right down the road. Verse 18. The general said, don't let Hezekiah mislead you. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the king of Assyria? He said, God is powerless against the Assyrian army. And all the kings of the earth are powerless against the Assyrian army. And whatever God they serve didn't deliver all of them we've already destroyed. And yours isn't going to be able to deliver you. Again, the Bible said we're not ignorant of Satan's devices. He attacks at our weakest and most vulnerable point. I can promise you when you're here on Sunday night like we were last Sunday night 
and you are jumping and running and clapping and squealing and, 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 and shouting and talking in tongues and feeling the Holy Ghost, I promise you there wasn't a devil within a mile of this place. Only a fool would say there were any devils in here. They're not going to bother you when you're in that setting. He's going to wait till things ain't going so good. He's going to wait till you're not feeling so great. He's going to wait until you've just been slammed with something financially, mentally, emotionally, physically, family-wise, marriage-wise. He's going to wait till you've just been slammed and then he's going to start saying these things. He's going to show up at your gate and start working on your trust in God, your faith in God, your desire to be faithful to God. I've pastored here 18 years. You know that, right? Back in April was 18 years. I ain't ever preached a message on the devil in the whole 18 years I've been here. But the economy of our day the day that we live in demands that as pastor, I need to tell you who the enemy is. And I need to tell you we can't be ignorant of his devices. Can you say amen, somebody? What are the signs that we are in fact listening to the enemy at the gate? When you quit praying, it's usually a good sign you've been listening to the enemy at the gate. When you don't rely on or walk by faith, it's a good sign you're listening to the enemy at the gate. When we miss church for no good reason, it's a good sign that we're listening to the enemy at the gate. When we get here but don't worship, good sign that we're listening to the enemy at the gate. When we don't ask God for help in the time of trouble, it's a good sign we're listening to the enemy at the gate. And whenever we come to the place that we don't trust God, it's a real good sign we have listened to the enemy at the gate. The Assyrian goal was clearly to install doubt and fear in God's people. The devil knows that if a child of God is living with doubt and fear, he cannot be living by faith at the same time. Either you are allowing doubt and fear to control your life, or you're allowing faith to control your life. But they never work both together side by side at the same time. One cancels out the other. Faith cancels out fear. Fear cancels out faith. If you've got faith, fear's going to flee. If you're full of fear, there's not going to be any faith present. The devil knows that if a saint lives in fear, their defeat is a foregone conclusion. It don't matter to me if it means you got to turn the news off to shut down the voice of the enemy at the gate, I don't care. It don't matter me if you got to quit watching ungodly television shows to shut down the voice of the enemy at the gate, I really don't care. It don't matter me if you've got to cancel some magazine subscriptions so you're not filling your brain with the words of the enemy at the gate. I don't care because all that matters is that we focus on God in a day like this. We get our attention on those things that are above. We walk by faith. We trust in God. We talk to Him. It's in this part of the story that Sennacherib sends what he calls his final ultimatum. This is your last chance, he says. If you don't heed this chance, then I'm going to utterly destroy you. And in Isaiah chapter 37, verses 16 to 20, we find that Hezekiah takes Sennacherib's letter. What's he do with it? 
sit down and cry, weep and wail, my life's over, he's going to destroy us. No, here's what the Bible says, and I'm quoting. He spreads it out before the Lord and prays. He takes Sennacherib's words, the enemy at the gate. He takes his words and he just lays them out before God. And he said, I'm going to pray about this. What do you do when the enemy attacks your faith? What do you do when the enemy attacks your emotions? When he attacks your family, your marriage, your finances, your job, even your relationship with God, what should be our response? First, prayer. First, prayer. A part of that response needs to be not only prayer, but we need to focus more intently on God, on His power and on His ability than we have before. We need to spread them out. We need to get into the habit of spreading all these matters out before the Lord. God, this is what's happening in my life. This is the pressure I'm under. This is what the enemy's trying to bring to bear. Help me. We need to acknowledge that God is supreme. We need to acknowledge that God is almighty. We need to acknowledge that He is more than able to handle all that we present to Him in prayer. We need to be thinking along the thoughts, I know this is bad. I know there's a lot of people thinking this way. I know that voice is louder and more effective than it's ever been. But guess what? My God is almighty. Nothing or nobody's bigger than him. Hezekiah sought the godly counsel of Isaiah. Hezekiah took all of the lies and the threats and the accusations to the prophet of God. And when he got to the prophet Isaiah, Hezekiah said, here's everything that Sennacherib and this wicked general has said to me, and I need you to pray about it. The Bible says that Isaiah did not pray, but he responded immediately with a word from the Lord for Hezekiah. The prophet of God. Brother Kleindens has been a prophet to this church the last several weeks, and I'm thankful for that. How many of you would lift a hand and say, you know, in one of the services, at least one of the services, I got an absolute rhema word from God. Would you lift your hand up if that's your testimony? I want you to look around you. Leave the hands up while everybody looks around. Look around you. Look how many have. Almost every hand in the building. Thank God. For a prophet that can bring us a word from the Lord. Here's what Isaiah said to Hezekiah. Isaiah the prophet said, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen. I am going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country and there I will have him cut down with a sword. Isaiah said, don't worry about what he's saying. I can tell you what his end's going to be. I can tell you what's going to happen to him. I'll tell you who's going to win. How many times have I stood in this pulpit and said to you, God's got the last word? How many times have I said God's got the last move? How many times have I reminded us that no matter what else is going on, just hold on because God's got the final say. You know what's amazing is Isaiah said to Hezekiah, I'm going to put a spirit in him so that when he hears a certain report, He's going to say, i got to go back to my own country. And when he gets back to his own country, he said, God said, there will I have him cut down with the sword. All you got to do is read to the end of the chapter. He goes home. Bad news, goes home. 
Just like God said, just like Isaiah prophesied, he goes home, he goes into his temple to pray to his God, and his own two sons come in with their swords drawn and kill Sennacherib with a sword. Let's go on. Verses 37, 36. I told Brother Rivera before church, he read my notes. I said, I, I probably going to be a part three of this thing. Verses 37, 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death. I want you to listen to this. Everybody paying attention? Chapter 37, verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death. Listen. A hundred and eighty-five thousand men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies around them. In the middle of the night, When Assyria had 185,000 soldiers ready to go, and Israel couldn't even, Jerusalem couldn't even get 200 guys, 2,000 guys that could ride a horse. 2,000 guys that could wield a sword or throw a spear. And in the middle of the night, God sent an angel that killed 185,000 of the enemy. Can I tell you, and this is the whole crux of my message, is that if at any time Israel would have compromised with the enemy at the gate, if at any time Hezekiah would have said, you know, we can't beat them. I know we'll be servants to them, but we probably ought to go with them. At least we'll be alive. If at any time they would have said, Maybe their wise men would get together and say, well, you know, we could kind of do this and do a little of that and do a little of that and that make them happy and do a little of this and a little compromise and a little cut short here. If at any time they would have listened to the enemy at the gate and allowed the enemy at the gate to move them away from who they were called to be, this story would have ended much different. It ended with 185,000 of the enemy soldiers destroyed in the middle of one night while all of Jerusalem lay asleep in their bed. They wake up in the morning and the Bible said the bodies were all around them, 185,000 dead soldiers all around them. And it would not have happened, Brother Thorpe, if they had ever listened to the enemy at the gate. It happened that way because they put their feet. I think it's the first time I've preached in tennis shoes in all my life. It's because I just got back from camp right before church. I told my wife, bring me a shirt and pants. Forgot to tell her to bring me shoes. I kind of like preaching in tennis shoes, though. If they would not have planted their feet and said, even if we die, we're going to die Christians. Well, I don't guess they were Christians. <laughs> we're going to die people of God. Even if we die, we're going to die without compromising. We're going to die standing our ground. We're going to die if they come in here, 185,000 of them. We don't even have 2,000 that can swing a sword and throw a spear and ride a horse at the same time. If they come in here, they can wipe us out. But they're going to wipe out a group of godly people that made their mind up. We're not backing up on God. And when you make your mind up, that book is true. God is true. What I believe is true. What I'm living is true. When you make your mind up about that, that's when God says, hold on, I'm going to take care of the 185,000 for you. Stand your grounds, my message. Don't compromise with this world. 
One of the best ways not to compromise is don't fill your spirit with this world. Don't fill your spirit with the spirit of this world. I had someone tell me in the last week, you preach narrow like you've been preaching. There, everybody will leave and go find another church. Number one, I don't believe that. But number two, if you do, me and mama are going to stay here and live for God. Because I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I don't care what other people say it. It don't matter nothing to me what the educators are teaching. It don't matter to me what the politicians are saying. It don't matter to me what Fox or CNN or MSNBC or NBC, ABC, CBS, you name it. I don't care what they're saying. I care what that old black back book's got to say though. And I've got my mind made up. I'm going to build my life on that book. Jesus is fixing to come. And one of the things he said, I'm going to come after a people who have not denied my name. People who have stayed faithful. People who run the race. Say amen somebody. I left my watch at the camp. I'm liable to preach all night. What time is it? Let's stand. Quarter after. Can I make just one more statement? Jerusalem, as I said, if you got a map of the Middle East, it would have been nothing but a dot on the map. Nothing left but one walled town. Whole country's been destroyed. All the neighboring countries been destroyed. Assyria, Brother Tim, has made a swath, a path through the Middle East, and everybody in their way was destroyed. Now they're surrounded by 185,000 people. And the general makes fun of them. You can't even get an army of 2,000 together. You can't fight with us. In the middle of the night, God destroys 185,000 without that 2,000 ever having to embarrass themselves trying to get on a horse. Here's my last question of the night. If God can do that, what's going on in your life that he can't do? That the enemy's tried to convince you is too big for God. If God can get rid of 185,000 in a night without one sword by a man being pulled, then what's going on in your life that God would take care of? Oh, friend, I'm telling you, you can trust Him. I'm telling you, you can put your faith in Him. I'm telling you, you can build your life on that old book. It works. It's true. It's settled forever. Do you love the Lord? You love his word. Have you made your mind up you're going to live for him? Time to go get your kids. I love you with all my heart. Let's go to heaven together, okay? God bless y'all.